I'm here from the Gromit, and um, I'm the Director of Business Development, so if you have any questions later, happy to chat. So at most point or another, most of the people in this room have been asked what the maker movement is. It's a catchy buzz phrase, and I know I've been asked many times to explain it. What is the quirky, creative, and yes, powerful wave that all of us are riding? Rarely, if ever, however, have I heard asked the why. Why is it that we need a movement to describe something as fundamental to human nature as product design and creation? Something that has been happening since someone back there, way back there, originally actually did create the wheel for the first time. Why do we need this? And that why is where the grommet comes into play. We are a launch platform. We find early stage innovative products and help them to move from the project stage to the functioning business stage to meet the market. We were founded by Jules Pieri and Joanne Domenicani in 2008 to champion a concept that came to be known as citizen commerce. By this we mean empowering the consumer, giving people the power to choose which products are out there in the market and which products we choose to buy, to vote for with our dollars. Buy differently. Buy the products you believe in. Partake in citizen commerce. They did this because they had learned that the business of product launch was huge and very broken. That while historically there were multiple rungs in the ladder of launch, that was no longer the case. And it was ripe for a point of innovation. There needed to be something to give the early stage maker, as well as the discerning consumer, a choice. At the same time that retail was consolidating, however, through the 30s, or excuse me, through the last 30 years, 80s, 90s, and even the early 2000s, technology was coming around that was making it easier than ever to communicate with one another. A new frontier in interconnectivity in the form of social media, as well as easily accessed video. Tools that had previously only been at the disposal of a select few we're suddenly entering layman's territory. We all carry high production cameras on our phones now, videos even. This tool became vital to all of us in the way we communicate with one another, but it also created an opportunity to help new products get to market. And this intersection is where the grommet comes into play. The maker movement was necessary because of a chasm that had developed in product manufacturing. But the maker movement became a movement because of the new technological tools that came around at the same time. Harnessing both of these pieces is where we play. And we are using the power of a community, an engaged community at that, video, and cool products to create a business. Before I go further, a little bit about myself. My name's Lauren. And I come from, um, I'm the Director of Business Development at the Gromit by way of Dartmouth College and Bain and & Company, as well as a few experiments, including a year of running a boutique hotel in New Zealand along the way. I mention this circuitous path not because it's especially interesting, but rather because it has shaped my perception around those foibles, those pitfalls that an entrepreneur encounters, must encounter, that it's not easy. But between big business, non-business, and now a startup, I've learned that mission counts. Mission is everything. And I truly, truly believe in what the Gromit is doing and in how we can help shape this economy. We're not simply selling clever products. The products are clever and we are selling them, so by all means, go on the website. We're shaping economic pathways, weed whacking routes that previously existed but had gone untended. And in this process, we're re-empowering both ourselves as consumers as well as the makers we represent. As I mentioned, the traditional ladder was broken. While once upon a time, you create a product, you start it locally, see if there's any interest in your local community, move on to regional channels, and then move on to national chains in a scalable, sustainable way. The expectation came to be that you needed to vault from zero to 60 
nearly overnight to go from idea and prototype to big box distribution. And not, that's nearly impossible for many early stage products, as many of you know. And many businesses fell in the process of trying. That you needed a pogo stick to leap that vault. We wanted to give them another route because what we found was that the more innovative a product, the less likely it was to succeed. That big retailers had more to lose in launching something that was untested than they had to gain. That they couldn't take the risk of taking a product that didn't really have a decent forecast and investing in its production. And as a result, some of the most interesting designs fell to the drawing room floor. I mentioned this not to paint big box retailers as the bad guy here. They're their own businesses, and they need to run their businesses as they see fit, as suits their needs the best. But if we, as makers, entrepreneurs, and consumers, are dissatisfied with the state of innovation health, then we need to seize that opportunity to create the new channels and to create the pathways to, for route to market. That there is a way to make this happen, but it's on us. Big business is going to do what big business does. We have a nimble capacity that they do not. We can harness new technology literally as the code is rolling out of dev. We can do things that our nimbleness allows us in a different way to re-clear this path and make a road for a new generation of makers. This particular product, Inroad, actually just launched a couple of weeks ago, and it was an overnight success. If you look at it in its packaging, however, it looks a little like a roll of duct tape. And it, it wouldn't necessarily speak to a consumer from, from the shelf aisles. With a video, it came to life. So if we want to change the landscape of mainstream retail, let's do it. We'll build a media platform, tell the story of new to market products, pluck the best of the best, and give them a voice. Often things like packaging and shelf real estate just come down to marketing budgets, not to product innovation. So let's fix it. We'll create a platform where success and failure can be decided by the users, by the shoppers, by the consumers who are voting. Give them a chance to let the product fail or succeed on the merit of its design, not on the budget behind it. Video is central to the storytelling in literally giving the product a voice. And when we started in 2008, actually six years ago this week, we were the only platform using video as a core part of our, of our business model. Now it's not optional. If you're going to create something, you need to have a video behind it. But that doesn't invalidate the use that we've had previously. It is still core to our model and still a classic part of what we are. Our product, product launch platform also creates an authentic, unvarnished story of the product. We're not trying to become the marketing department that the product might not have ordinarily. That's not our, our shtick. We're just trying to tell the story of the product, how we discovered it, and why we think it's special. And perhaps you will too. We don't consider ourselves a retailer, and this is something that's very interesting. We consider the maker to be our consumer. Our goal is to work with the makers to help them clear that hurdle of mainstream retail and get out there. Our e-commerce site is absolutely a fantastic test platform. Our consumers are engaged, and I'll come to that more in a moment. And they also represent the early entry to mainstream retail. They're not crowdfunding site consumers. They're the first person in the subdivision to buy the product. As I mentioned, I discovered the site Christmas Shopping myself a couple of years ago. I love crowdfunding sites, but I don't consider myself an especially early adopter. I am a good grommet consumer. And now we have a wholesale platform that can then take the maker, not just from our site, but all the way through to indie retail and then beyond. And success will mean something different for every different product, but we want to help them achieve whatever that version of success may be. We've launched over 2,000 products since our start in 2008. And in that time, we've learned a lot through our, as I mentioned, very engaged community. Each day, we launch the video describing that product 
in an email curated specifically around it to our two million subscribers. Simultaneously, that product is available on the e-commerce site and the conversation board opens on its page. And we open the floodgates to all two million subscribers to ask questions, provide comments and feedback, and otherwise interact directly with the maker. Our customers keep us on our toes. They are awesome. They do not take what we are selling sitting down. They don't simply swallow what we're dishing out. They want to know why we've chosen it, why it costs that much, why it's produced, where it's produced, if it's coming in another color, how does the sizing work? You name it, they're asking it. And that feedback is really valuable to us, but immeasurably valuable to the maker behind the product because they can take all of that and spin it into 2.0. Within 24 hours of launch, we honestly do know whether or not this product is going to have legs in the mass market. Honestly, however, we really know this within an hour. Within that first hour, we can see the trajectory that the product is having on our site, and through that, we can segue into seeing how it will perform within the mass market. At this point, one in 200 Americans is a Gromit subscriber, and that includes babies, older generations, you name it. So if we get down to relevant potential shoppers, it's one in 50. And that validation is really important. Now, does this mean that a product that has a lukewarm launch on the grommet is doomed to failure? No, not necessarily. What it does mean, however, is that it's probably more of a niche product and it needs to find its audience. Um, this product right here, Bell V, was launched last month and it <laughs> they took us to the ringer. It is a beautiful ice cream scooper designed by Dr. Carl Ulrich. He's the director of innovation at the Wharton School. And he happens to be an ice cream scooper aficionado. He collects antique ice cream scoopers. He put a lot of thought into designing the very best ice cream scooper that the market had ever known. It's ergonomically designed. It has a longer head to be able to scoop ice cream without torquing your wrist. It's 3D printed out of super fine materials. So it's new age, high design manufacturing. And it honestly is beautiful. It is also $50. So the mass majority of the market was unimpressed with this price point. And within seconds of launch, our audience let us know that they were unimpressed with a $50 ice cream scooper. Not necessarily interested in even knowing why it was $50, they just, this was not where they were going. Yet every few comments, someone would chime in and say, well, wait a minute, I actually own an ice cream shop, this is brilliant. For every $15 ice cream scoop that I break, this would be well worth the money. Or somebody who really just places a premium on high design innovation. It's something that they, they like looking at it. It looks nice, they like the story, it's cool. There's, there's something behind it and they're willing to take that. The important point here is that there's a choice. And choice means individual empowerment, not universal agreement. And the ability to vote for your priorities with your dollars. And for those people, this choice is a fantastic one. Yet, if we were looking at the way mass market retail creates the choices available to us in the marketplace, Bellevue certainly would not be out there. There's not a big box distributor on the market who is going to say, yes, a $50 ice cream scooper is the way to go. Because they know that the majority of the mass market is not particularly interested in an investment ice cream scooper. But for those people, it is critical. And if those choices have already been made for us, we're inadvertently disenfranchised. Consumer spending drives an enormous percentage of economic activity in this country and beyond. And so the products we buy and the votes that we place do create the world that we live in. If those choices have already been made for us by account executives forecasting future, future retail spending, we don't have the option. We can't vote for our values. We want our community, this world, to be able to vote with their purchases, whether it's for Made in the USA, an underrepresented entrepreneur, something that's eco and green, a particular price point, what have you. These options are out there. Today, earlier than ever, it is, we can create something from scratch. That while these choices are getting harder and there is a chasm out there, we can now design something and have it prototyped literally overnight, thanks to 3D printing. 
fundraise through crowdfunding sources, work with groups like Dragon Innovation or Makers Road to sustain manufacturing. And then we, or Etsy Wholesale, or similar platforms can help with mainstream market entry. This is, here is the Nomiku, you may have seen it before, is a great example. It's something that is a niche product, but is gaining momentum through all of these channels. We're working closely to help them to get to mainstream retail. That crowdfunding has done well, but more people need to know about it. Even the White House has become involved. As President Obama put it, we need to be a country of producers, not just consumers. I'd argue that we already are. Just the parties involved have become disconnected from one another, and we're bringing them back together. We launched our wholesale platform at the White House Maker Fair, and we were asked there to be there to represent that route to mainstream market entry. Something that both Eric has spoken about today, as well as Zach earlier, that it's, this is a really big hurdle. 99% of the maker movement is involved in the making. But then once you have it, what becomes of it? We need to get it out there. This infographic shows the big business that we have become. It might still be a mystery to some big business, but it in itself is huge. And it'll go into a few details here, but the innovative and new to market products coming from this movement are going to be critical in shaping the future of our economy. The numbers are going up. At least 57% of the market considers themselves to be makers in some capacity. Maker fairs themselves have been rising in attendance, and the White House is involved because of the resources that are there. The design chain is now simpler than ever if we harness it appropriately. And the money that's going in and coming out of it is enormous and growing. By 2025, we expect crowdfunding to be in the 93 billion range. It's also growing local economies. This isn't just a national scale. For the places that you come from, for the towns that you would like to bolster, this is big. And more importantly, we're creating two out of every three new jobs. That's been a hot topic for the six years that the grommet has been in business, and it's going to continue to be a hot topic for the generation that's come out. We're helping to support more than just making new products. We're supporting a new pathway in the economy. And the industrial tech revolution that we are shaping and the industrial tech economy that we're going to be a part of is important. Um, we don't really have time for questions, but by all means, please come find me, and I'm happy to speak, chat, whenever. Apologies for the tech issues earlier. Thank you for bearing with me. Thank you.